deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. A while back, during the height of the fake plague, we did an episode entitled, While You Were Waiting for the Book of Revelation, Satan Already Drove By. And in it, we deconstructed Revelation and the Torah Old Testament prophecies it borrowed heavily from, illustrating how none of them were of Christ, and belief in them would only lead to misdirection and the spiritual Dead Sea. And by the way, that episode and all of our episodes are done from the perspective of the pre-Nicene Christians and using their first Christian Bible of 144 AD as a guide. Anyway, what we didn't cover was what actually inspired these Torah prophecies. What was the source of these visions that these Yahweh prophets were having? And whether you want to call them prophets, fortune tellers, magicians, or sorcerers, they were everywhere in that Torah. Dozens of them, foretelling this or that invasion of this or that wrath and fury of their Yahweh deity. Yahweh is going to kill all of you. Obey the Yahweh. Our snake bites will be healed if we look at a bronze snake statue. And by way of sub-reference, these are the very same snakes that Yahweh rained down to kill his own worshippers after they complained to him about not having enough food or water in Numbers 21.6. Here, I'll give you ingrate something to complain about, says Yahweh. Now, muttering or screaming these things alone inside of a tent in the middle of a desert would be one thing. Nobody really cares. But these sorcerers were looked upon as speaking the very words of Yahweh. Thus, what they said were the commands of Yahweh, and they were to be obeyed literally under the pain of death if refused. And remember, Yahweh was just one of dozens of gods, or more accurately, deities flying around at the time, as we read in Psalm 82. Chemosh, Baal, Asherah, Molech being just some of the others. And the Jews themselves were part of over a dozen different tribes. Uh, Judeites, Israelites, Moabites, Ammonites, Canaanites, maybe some Trilobites, all marrying and killing each other and worshipping different gods and deities at one time or another. And all these different groups had prophets, or more accurately, sorcerers that they relied on for direction. For example, when the Yahweh worshippers battled it out with the Moabites and their deity Chemosh, each side had prophets predicting victory, as we read in Second Kings. Yahweh, we are told, lost that battle against the other war god, and the Israelites fled back home defeated. Now, long story short, it was a Mad Max movie on loop, and it really had nothing to do with Christianity. But I digress. And I want to tell you uh, what all these prophet magicians had in common. And before I do that, let's take a look at some of their more vivid visions so you can get a taste of their zeal. For Samuel 15.3, the prophet Samuel gives King Saul this commandment from Yahweh, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Ezekiel 9, 4-7 has this charming account, And the Lord said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither ye have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. Starting to get a little context, a little texture. Let's go to Hosea 13:16, and it describes a punishment from the Lord. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. I guess Yahweh was uh, having a tough day there. And in Deuteronomy 32, 23 through 25, says that after the Israelites incited God's jealousy, and by the way, remember, Yahweh says he is a jealous God and demands that they don't worship other gods, he vowed, quote, I will spend mine arrows upon them. 
the sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs, unquote. And in Numbers chapter 31, Yahweh gives a green light to Moses and his instructions to the Israelite soldiers about how to treat certain women and children that are captured in war. And we read, Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. But all the women and children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Unquote. Wow, I mean, you can just feel our Christian God and the teachings of Jesus just oozing out of these people, can't you? Well, we definitely have so much in common with them, right? Now, how someone can read this and claim that our Christian God magically transitioned from this demonic sewer or that we need to wallow in this filth in order to, quote, have context, unquote, is absolutely beyond me. This is cognitive dissonance on parade. And in any event, let's continue. Isaiah 13.9 contains this message from Yahweh. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes, and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. They shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not spare children. Now, with this background, all of which you can read for yourself in your Judeo-Christian Bible, let us pause. Let's reflect for a moment. Now, I didn't hear anything of Christ in there, did you? And in a little while, you're going to find out exactly why. Now, to give this some modern-day context and perspective, this would be like your parish priest in Des Moines, Iowa, grinding his way through another homily and then suddenly looking up, suddenly animated and shouting, Yahweh has given me a vision! The sins of the parishioners in Cincinnati must not be allowed! They have become an abomination in the eyes of Yahweh! Kill them all! Women and children, leave no building standing! Arise and gather weapons! We will crush the apostates! Now, does that sound a little over the top for a priest in Des Moines, Iowa? Well, why? Why? You see, Judeo-Christians and Jews worship the same Yahweh. Who are we to say that Yahweh wouldn't issue this command to a priest, just as he did to his Torah prophets? Anyway, it makes for an interesting thought experiment, and a reminder that the first Christian Bible didn't have the Old Testament Torah stapled to the front of it, so for them it would have been an unnecessary thought experiment. The pre-Nicene Christians believed God was only revealed to us through His Son, Jesus Christ, and their Bible reflected this belief. You see, Yahweh simply wasn't part of the equation, just as Vishnu or Buddha or Isis or Saul Invictus wasn't. All foreign religions worshipping alien deities. And by the way, you can get a free copy of that Bible at theveryfirstbible.org. But back to our topic, we see in these prophecies and commands from Yahweh a recurring theme of killing everything, including animals, and especially women and children. Death and destruction dominates these visions of the sorcerers, doesn't it? But there was another kind of vision, another recurring theme they all shared, and it was of the surreal variety involving humanoid creatures in strange geometric shapes. And it is through this next passage that we come closer to the answer of what they all had in common. Let's read it from Ezekiel. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on the four sides they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, 
and the wings of one touched the wings of the other. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. And continuing with the vision, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made of like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. Unquote. Now remember, these creatures with the likeness of man then take Ezekiel with them in their craft, bringing him to a temple on top of the highest mountain. And during his flight there, Ezekiel mentions feeling the hand of Yahweh on him. And he's then taken to these beings, quote, temple, unquote. I mean, wow, that was quite a ride, wasn't it? Kind of, oh, I don't know, kind of trippy. And you'll notice how similar the imagery and descriptions are to what was written in Revelation. Now, you might be saying at this point to yourself, gee, Darren, I know this sounds crazy, but were these guys on drugs or something? And the answer is yes, my friend, very much so. A lot of drugs, but not just any drug a very special kind of drug. Now, it would be easy to dismiss all of this as a bunch of Jews wandering around the desert and getting high like it was some kind of Bronze Age Burning Man festival, but that would be a big mistake, and we don't want to miss the forest for the trees on this one. You see, this special drug is very unique. It's everywhere, yet hard to acquire in quantity and synthesize it if you don't know what you're doing. It's in animals, it's in plants, it's in trees. In fact, some of it is in you right now. That's right, even you. When you have a lucid dream in deep REM state, this drug is involved. When you're born and when you die, large quantities are released into your brain. Ever hear people describe a near-death experience in NDE? Well, it's the same thing. And it's endogenous. That's a $5 word, meaning that your body creates the drug on its own. But if it's used in a fashion similar to how these prophet sorcerers used it, you can go to the same exact place these sorcerers did in literally three to four minutes and be done with the entire trip in about 15 minutes. Now, that's pretty handy if you need an answer or guidance or direction or prophecy. Pretty handy when you need help deciding on who or when to go to war with. Pretty handy when you need to confuse or trick a foe or enemy. Or say you just wanted to interpret someone else's dreams for them. More on that later. So what else do we know about this unique drug? Well, we know it's been used for thousands of years, all across Europe and especially in ancient Egypt. In fact, it's highly likely Egypt is where the Yahweh cult learned about it and began to weaponize its effects. The name of the drug is DMT, and because I'm not an ethnobotanist and this isn't an episode of Breaking Bad, we're going to go ahead and skip over the finer points of synthesizing dimethyltryptamine, MAOIs, and neuropharmacology in general. But put simply, it's a Schedule I narcotic, and it's quite illegal. But the real reasons you shouldn't take it will be addressed a little bit later on in this episode. Now, for purposes of our discussion, it's relevant that we know DMT is found in its highest concentrations in plants and trees that would have been ubiquitous in the biblical region we're addressing, namely the common papyrus reed and acacia trees and bushes. Other sources mentioned by botanists are the blue water lily and viper's blue gloss, but for everyday get-it-where-you-can-find-it type use, 
The common reed and acacia bush will do quite nicely, thank you very much. Don't need to look too hard to find it, even when you live in a desert. Now, what we're going to talk about next isn't just me guessing at things. Dozens of universities have been doing thousands of different studies on DMT for decades, including John Hopkins University, and millions of casual and chronic users have cataloged their experiences, so we have a pretty deep pool of knowledge to draw from. In fact, I may even throw some choice quotes from Terence McKenna in here if I get around to it. I'll have all the links in the show notes so you can read about it until your eyes glaze over, but for now, we're going to have at it in the form of a overview. Now, unlike the people of South America who source their DMT through a ayahuasca MAOI drink, the Yahweh priests would have smoked it after processing the reeds or acacia bark, and consumed in this matter, the DMT slices through the blood-brain barrier like a hot knife through butter, sending our sorcerer to the spirit world in under four minutes. He would have felt his soul leaving his body and been transported to this new place that looks and feels more real than real. Now, I should probably pause here and interject that this is not like getting high on cannabis. It's not a wow, look at the pretty colors, or ha, that's funny, and now I want a bag of Doritos. It's as far removed from that as kindergarten is from graduate school. In fact, using language largely fails to describe it. Now, for virtually everyone that has taken DMT over thousands of years, there are 10 main types of entities that the user will meet, ranging from jokers to dark beings to machine elves and even quote-unquote angels of light. And they're very interested in talking with you after you arrive. They'll tell you that they're your spirit guide and they want to help you and show you things. They say that they want to give you knowledge. But sometimes they want to do more than just talk. Sometimes they like to run experiments on you. Remember the stories that people tell about being abducted by aliens and having uh, experiments done on them? Well, it's the same thing, and it's probably the same entities. Now, some of the things that these unclean spirits say and do cannot be repeated on this podcast, and many lives have been destroyed even after a single trip. Okay, let's get the lay of the land here. First, where you are not is heaven. Let me be 100% crystal clear on that. At best, this is a cheap imitation of heaven, a crude finger painting, an inaccurate rendering of what something wants you to think heaven looks like, a dollar store version of heaven. And if you haven't already guessed, these entities are not angels. On the other hand, we can't just slap the label of hell on this place either. Remember, your body produces pure DMT, and this is where DMT takes you. Or rather, this is where DMT drops you off before the regular bus stop. Not to put too fine a point on it, but you're trespassing in the spirit world right now. You snuck past the gate, but you're nowhere near heaven. You're in the break room of the spiritual dollar store. We'll go ahead and call this place the first celestial sphere. And these entities, or more accurately, as we find them described in the first Christian Bible, unclean spirits do not have your best interests in mind at all. Which, in a roundabout way, brings us back to the subject of the episode. Now, for our purposes, two of the most interesting experiments conducted by the university researchers involved asking the unclean spirits to help the subject find and recover a lost item in the physical world. In this case, it was simply a Bic lighter, and the entity showed them where it was. The second experiment showed the subject could meet with the same entity every time he consumed the DMT. He eventually referred to the entity as his girlfriend after multiple visits and having developed a quote-unquote relationship with it. Now, in light of what we know about the prophecies, visions, and commands communicated by the Yahweh priests in their Torah, 
I want you to think about those two experiments very carefully. Now, take the results of these two relatively benign findings and weaponize them. You're a Yahweh prophet, and when you take DMT, you don't do it for a casual psychedelic experience. You're taking it for a very specific purpose, and that purpose is to communicate and interact specifically with Yahweh. Now, some people have this ability and some don't. Those who do become famous prophets. Those who don't become false prophets and, as we read in that Torah, are subsequently killed by their own people. And like we saw with the simple Bic lighter experiment, we know this Yahweh or any other unclean spirits can help us in the physical world to achieve things that to the unknowing will seem magical and supernatural. Because when you get right down to it, they are. And from them, other parlor tricks were manifested in the form of gematria, the Kabbalah, astrology, and tarot cards. And remember, all of this sorcery is condemned in the first Bible as we read in Galatians 5, 18 through 21. But if of the Spirit ye are led, ye are not under the law. Now manifest are the works of the flesh, which are fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strifes, jealousies, indignations, contentions, division, sex, envyings, drunkenness, revels, and such like, of which I previously tell you, even as also before, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God." Unquote. Which brings us to the question, did the Ark of the Covenant actually contain processed DMT? Well, I don't know, but I do know it was constructed of acacia wood, as was the tabernacle. We're also reminded of the verse, For in a cloud I will appear upon the ark cover, in Leviticus 16.2. Even widely known Israeli psychologist Benny Shannon has suggested that the burning bush mediating Moses' theophany in Exodus 3.2 was a type of DMT containing acacia, whose vaporized fumes he inhaled. Not to mention dozens of articles in Israeli newspapers making the very same connection. And of course, uh, Dr. Rick Strassman's best-selling book, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, A New Science of Spiritual Revelation in the Hebrew Bible, in which he reveals the striking similarities between the visions of the Hebrew prophets and the DMT state described by his own research volunteers. It's certainly food for thought. Anyway, Remember the Moabites and their god Chemosh that defeated Yahweh in the battle described in 2 Kings? The Moabite prophets were doing the same thing with Chemosh and interacting with him and invoking his power during their own DMT trips. In fact, all of the tribes were doing it, and make no mistake, human sacrifices were part of the package. Imagine the power these unclean spirits felt, not just dominating and possessing a single person, but dominating and possessing entire tribes, thousands of people at a time, becoming their god, or, more accurately, pretending to be a god. And if you were this pretend god, you would certainly be jealous of other pretend gods too, wouldn't you? In fact, we know Yahweh certainly was jealous. In fact, it's his first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But none of these murderous, manipulative things are of Christ and our Christian God as revealed to us only through him. Absolutely none of it. Example. These entities will bring up lots of topics to talk about. They'll talk to you about just about anything. But the one thing the entities will not talk to you about is Jesus Christ. And in fact, they will kick you out of the spiritual dollar store if you keep bringing him up. But they will tell you that you are a god. They'll say, we're all gods. And remember one of the ten DMT entities appearing as an angel of light? What does that remind us of? Oh, hmm. Well, let's see here. Turning to 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 6, in the first Bible we read, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, 
or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, with what I've explained to you, go back and read the Torah Old Testament passages that I've quoted. You'll find it as a key effortlessly slides into a lock. And maybe now you can understand why the pre-Nicene Christians would never allow this Torah and its Yahweh deity to be stapled onto the first Christian Bible. It would be an abomination. Now, a part two of this final Who's God series episode may be necessary, but for now, I'd like to leave you with Laodiceans chapter 6, verse 12. It's from the first Bible. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the archons and spiritual sovereigns, against the system holders of the darkness of this age, against the wicked spiritual hosts in the heavens. Amen. And with that, I'm Darren Kalama reminding you, you can find Pre-Nicene Perspective on many of the social media platforms. If you uh, derive some benefit from it, why not share it with others? And by doing so, if you help lead even one lost soul from the edge of the abyss, I'd say you did pretty good for just a couple mouse clicks. We'll see you next time. And uh, stay away from that DMT, okay? You've been listening to Pre-Nicene Perspective. To learn more about the First Bible and the First Christians, visit theveryfirstbible.org.